The Dinner A Novel by Herman Koch Chapter 1 We were going out to dinner. I won't say which restaurant because next time it might be full of people who've come to see whether we're there. Serge made the reservation. He's always the one who arranges it. The reservation. This particular restaurant is the one where you have to call three months in advance, or six, or eight. Don't ask me. Personally, I'll never want to know three months in advance where I'm going to eat on every, any given evening. But apparently some people don't mind. A few centuries from now, when historians want to know what kind of crazies people were at the start of the 21st century, all they'll have to do is look at the computer files of the so-called top restaurants. That information is kept on file. I happen to know that. If Mr. L was prepared to wait three months for a window seat last time, then this time he'll wait for five months for a table beside the men's room. That's what restaurants call customer relations management. Serge never reserves a table three months in advance. Serge makes a reservation on the day itself. He says he thinks of it as a sport. You have restaurants that reserve a table for people like Serge Sloman, and this restaurant happens to be one of them. One of many, I should say. It makes you wonder where, why there isn't one restaurant in the whole world, in the whole country, where they don't go faint right away when they hear the name Serge Lohman on the phone. He doesn't make the call himself, of course. He lets his secretary of one of, or one of his assistants do that. Don't worry about it. He told me when I talked to him a few days ago. They know me there. I can get us a table. All I'd asked was whether it wasn't a good idea to call in case they were full, and where we would go if they were. At the other end of the line, I thought I heard something like pity in his voice. I could almost see him shake his head. It was a sport. There was one thing I didn't feel like that evening. I didn't feel like being there when the owner or on-duty manager greeted Serge Lohman as though he was an old friend, like seeing how the waitress would lead him to the nicest table on the, si on the side facing the garden or how Serge would act as though he had it all coming to him. That deep down he was an, still an ordinary guy and that's why he felt entirely comfortable among other ordinary people which was precisely why I told him we would meet in the restaurant itself and not, as he suggested, at the cafe around the corner. It was a cafe where a lot of ordinary people went. How Serge Lohman would walk in there like a regular guy with a grin that said that all those ordinary people should, above all, go on talking and act as if he wasn't there. I didn't feel like that either. Chapter 2 The restaurant is only a few blocks from our house, so we walked. That brought us past the cafe where I hadn't wanted to meet Serge. I had my arm around my wife's waist. Her hand was tucked somewhere inside my cup. The sign outside the cafe was lit with the warm red and white colors of the brand of beer they had on tap. We're too early, I said to my wife. I mean, if we go now, we'll be right on time. My wife. I should stop calling her that. Her name is Claire. Her parents named her Marie Claire. But in time, Claire didn't feel like sharing her name with the magazine. Sometimes... I call her Marie, just to tease her, but I rarely refer to her as my wife on official occasions sometimes or in sentences like, my wife can't come to the phone right now, or my wife is very sure she asked for, for a room with this sea view. On evenings like this, Claire and I make the most of the moments when it's still just the two of us. Then it's as though everything is still up for grabs, as though the dinner date were only a misunderstanding, as though it's just the two of us out on the town. If I had to give a definition of happiness, it would be this. Happiness means nothing but itself. It doesn't have to be validated. Happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way, is the opening sentence of Paul Stoy's Anna Karimina. All, all I could hope is to add, all I could hope to add is that unhappy families and with them, those families, in particular, the unhappy Husband and wife can never get by on their own. The more validators, the merrier. Unhappiness loves company. Unhappiness can't stand silence. Especially not the uneasy silence that settles in when it is all alone. So when the bartender at the cafe put our beers down in front of us, Claire and I smiled at each other in the knowledge that we would soon be spending an entire evening in the company of the Lomans. In the knowledge that this was the finest moment of that evening, that from here on, it would be all downhill. I didn't feel like going to the restaurant. I never do. A fixed appointment for the immediate future is the gates of hell. The actual evening is hell itself. It starts in front of the mirror in the morning. 
what you're going to wear and whether you're not whether or not you're going to shave at times like this after all everything is a statement a pair of torn and stained jeans as much as a neatly ironed shirt if you don't scrape off the day's stubble you are too lazy to shave two days beer beard immediately makes them wonder whether this is some new look three days or more is just a step from total dissolution are you feeling all right you're not sick are you no matter what you do you're not free you shave but you're not free shaving is a statement as well apparently you found this evening significant enough to go in the trouble of shaving you see the others thinking in fact shaving already puts you behind one to zero and then i always have claire to remind me that this isn't an evening like every other claire is smarter than i am i'm not saying that i have some half-baked feminist sem sentiment or in order to endear women to me you'll never hear me claim that women in general are smarter than men or more sensitive more intuitive that they are more in touch with life or any of the other horse shit that when it's all said and done so-called sensitive men try to peddle more often than women themselves claire just happens to be smarter than i am i can honestly say that it took me a while to admit that during a few years together i thought she was intelligent i guess but intelligent in the usual sense precisely as intelligent in fact as you might expect my wife to be after all would i settle for a stupid woman any longer than a month in any case claire was intelligent enough for me to stay with her even after the first month and now almost 20 years later that hasn't changed so claire is smarter than I, that than i am but on evenings like this she still asks my opinion on what she should wear which earrings whether to wear her hair up or leave it down for women, earrings are sort of what shaving is for men. The bigger the earrings, the more significant, the more festive the evening. Claire has evenings I mean Claire has earrings for every occasion. Some people might say it's not smart to be insecure about what you wear. But that's not how I see it. The stupid woman is the one who thinks she doesn't need any help. What does a man know about the things like that the stupid woman thinks and proceeds to make the wrong choice? I I've sometimes tried to manage the Betty Axian Serge, whether she's wearing the right dress, whether her hair isn't too long, what Serge thinks of these shoes. The heels aren't too flat, are they? Or maybe they're too hot. But whenever I do, I realize there's something wrong with the picture. Something that seems unimaginable. No, it's fine. It's absolutely fine. I heard, I hear Serge say, but he, he's not really paying attention. It doesn't actually interest him. And besides, even if his wife were to wear the wrong dress, all the men would still, be, would still turn their heads as she walked by. Everything looks on her, so what she's moaning about. This wasn't a hip cafe. The fashionable, type, fashionable types didn't come here. It wasn't cool, Michelle would say. Ordinary people were, by far, in the majority. Not the particularly young or the particularly old, in fact, a little bit of everything all thrown together. But above all ordinary, the way a cafe should be. It was crowded. We stood close together beside the door to the men's room. Claire was holding her beer in one hand with the fingers of the other she was gently squeezing my wrist. I don't know, she said, but I've had the impression recently that Michelle's acting strange. Well, not strange, but different. Distant. Have you, haven't you noticed? Oh yeah? I said, I guess it's possible. I had to be careful not to look at Claire. We have known each other too well for that. My eyes would give me away. Instead, I behaved as though I was looking around the cafe as though I was deeply interested in the spectacle of ordinary people involved in lively conversation. I was relieved that I'd stuck to my guns, that we wouldn't be meeting the Lomans until we reached the restaurant. In my mind's eye, I could see Serge coming through the swinging doors, his grin encouraging the regulars, above all, to go on with what they were doing and pay no attention to him. He hasn't said anything to you, Claire asked. I mean, you two talk about other things. Do you think it might have something to do with a girl? Something he'd find easier to tell you about? Just then, the door to the men's room opened, and we had to step to one side, pressed even closer together. I felt Claire's beard glass clink against mine. Do you think it has something to do with girls? She asked again. If only that were true, I couldn't help thinking. Something to do with girls. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wonderfully normal. The normal adolescent mess. Can Chantel slash Meryl slash Rose spend the night? Do her parents know? If Chantel 
slash Meryl's slash Rose's parents think it's okay, it's okay with us. As long as you remember. As long as you, you're careful when you, uh, you know what I mean. I don't have to tell you about that anymore, right, Macho? Girls came to our house often enough, each one prettier than the next. They sat on the couch or at the kitchen table and greeted me politely when I came home. Hello, Mr. Loman. You don't have to call me Mr. Loman, just call me Paul. And so they would call me Paul a few times, but a couple of days later, I would be back to Mr. Loman again. Sometimes I would get one of them on the phone, and while I asked if I could take a message from Michelle, I would shut my eyes and try to connect the girl's voice at the other end of the line. They rarely mentioned their names. Just plunge right in. Is Michelle there? With a face. No, that's okay, Mr. Loman. It's just that his cell phone is switched off, so I thought I'd try this number. A couple of times when I came in unannounced, I had the impression that I caught them at something. Michelle and Chantel slash Meryl slash Rose, that they were watching the fabulous life on MTV was less in in insolent, innocently than they wanted me to think. That they've been fiddling with each other. That they've rushed to strain their clothes and hair when they've heard me coming. Something about the flush on Mitchell's cheek. Something heated, I told myself. To be honest, though, I had no idea. Maybe nothing was going on at all. Maybe all was pretty close to some extent as a good friend. A nice, rather handsome boy. Someone who could show up at a party. A boy they could trust. Precisely because he wasn't the kind who wanted to fiddle with them right away. No, I don't think it's got anything to do with a girl, I said, looking Claire straight in the eye now. That's the oppressive thing of a happiness. The way everything is out on the table like an open book. If I avoided looking at her any longer, she'll know for sure that something was going on with girls or worse. I think it's m more like something with school, I said. He's just done those exams. I think he's tired. I think he underestimated it a little, how tough his sophomore year would be. Did that sound believable? And above all, did it look believable when I said it? Claire's gaze shifted quickly back and forth between my right and left eye. Then she raised her hand to my shirt collar as though there was something out of place there that could be dealt with now, so I wouldn't look like an idiot when I got to the restaurant. She smiled and placed the flat of her hand against my chest. I could feel two fingertips against my skin right up where the top button on my shirt wasn't buttoned. Maybe that's it, she said. I think we we both just have to be careful that at a certain point he doesn't stop talking to us about things. That would get used to it, I mean. No, of course, but at this age, he kind of has a right to his own secrets. We shouldn't try to find out everything about him. Then maybe he'll clam up together, all together. I looked clear in the eye. My wife, I thought at that moment. Why shouldn't I call her out? My wife. I put him. I put my arm around her and pulled her close. Even if it was for the duration of the evening, my wife and I said to my, I said to myself, my wife and I would like to see the wine. What are you laughing about? Claire said. My wife said. I looked at my beer glasses. Mine was empty. Hers was still three fourths full, as usual. My wife didn't drink as fast as I did, which was another reason why I left it this evening, perhaps more than other evening. Nothing, I said. I was thinking. I was thinking about it. It happened quickly. One morning, I was looking at Claire, looking at my wife, probably with a loving gaze, or at least with a twinkle. And the next moment, I felt a damp film fly down over my eyes. Under no circumstances was she to notice anything strange about me. So I buried my face in her hair. I tightened my grip around her face and sniffed. Shampoo. Shampoo and something else. Something warm. The small happiness, I thought. What would this happy evening have been like? No more than an hour ago. I had simply waited downstairs until it was time to go rather than climb the stairs to Mitchell's room. What would the rest of our lives have been like? Would the smell of happiness I inhaled from my life here still have smelled only like happiness and not as it did now, like a distant memory, like the smell of something you could just see, just like that? Chapter 3 Mitchell? I was standing in the doorway to his room. He wasn't there. But let's not beat around the bush. I knew he wasn't there. He wasn't... He was in the garden fixing the back tire of his bike. I acted as though I hadn't noticed that. I pretended... I thought he was in his room. Michelle? I locked... I knocked on the door, which was half open. Claire was rummaging through the closets in our room. We would have to leave for the restaurant in less than an hour. She was hesitating between the black skirt with the boots 
or the black pants with the DK and Y sneakers. Which earrings she would ask me later? These or these? The little ones look best on her, I would reply. With either the skirt or the pants. Then I was in Michelle's room. I saw right away what I was looking for. I wanted to stress the fact that I've never done anything like that before. Never. When Michelle was chatting with his friends on the computer, I always stood beside him in such a way with my back half turned toward the desk that I couldn't see the screen. I wanted him to be able to tell from my posture that I wasn't spying or trying to peek over his shoulder I wasn't typed on the screen. Sometimes his cell phone made a noise, like pan pipes, to announce the text message. He had a tendency to leave his cell phone lying around. I won't deny that I was tempted to look at it sometimes, especially when he had gone out. Who sexy him? What did he slash she write? One time, I had even known there was Michelle's phone in my hand. Knowing that he wouldn't be coming back from the gym for another hour, that he'd simply forgot about it. That was his old phone. He saw me without the fire. The display showed one new message beneath an envelope icon. I don't know what got into me. Before I knew it, I had your cell phone in my hand. I was reading your message. Maybe no one would ever find out, but then again, maybe they would. He wouldn't say anything, but he was expecting me or his mother, nonetheless. A distant that with the passing of time would expand it into a substantial chasm. Our life as a happy family would never be the same. It was only a few steps to his desk to find the window. If I leaned forward, I would be able to see him in the garden on the flat stone terrace in front of the kitchen door where he was fixing his inner tube. And if Michelle looked up, he would see his father standing out the window of his room. I picked up his cell phone, a brand new black Samson, and slid it open. I didn't know his pin code if the phone was locked. I wouldn't be able to do a thing, but the screen lit up almost right away with a fuzzy photo of the Nike swoosh, probably on one of his own clothes. His shoes or the black knit cap he always wore. He even at summertime, temperatures and indoors, pulled down just above his eyes. I scrolled through the menu, which was roughly the same as the one on my phone. On my own phone, a Samsung 2, but six months old and therefore already hopelessly obsolete. I clicked on my files and then on videos. Sooner than expected, I found what I was looking for. I looked and felt my head gradually grow cold. It was a sold of, it was the sort of coldness you feel when you take too big of a bite from an ice cream cone or sip too greedily from an ice cold drink. The kind of coldness that hurt from the inside out. I looked up again and then I was looking. I and then I kept looking. There was more. I saw. But how much more was hard to say. Dad? Michelle's voice came from downstairs. But then I heard him coming up the stairs. I snapped shut the slide on the phone and put it back on his desk. Dad? It was too late to hurry into our bedroom to take a shirt or a jacket out of the closet and pose with it in front of the mirror. My only option was to come out of Mitchell's own room as casually and believably as possible, as though I'd been looking for something, as though I'd been looking for him. Dad? He had stopped at the top of the stairs and was looking past me into his room. Then he looked at me. He was wearing his neck cap, his black iPod Nando dangling, dangled from a cord at his chest, and a set of headphones was flung around his neck. You had to give him credit. Fashion status didn't interest him. After only a few weeks, he had replaced the white earbuds with a standard set of headphones because the sound was better. Happy families are all alike. That popped into my mind for the first time that evening. I was looking for... I began. I was wondering where you were. Michael had almost died at birth. Even these days I often thought back on that blue crumpled little body lying in the incubator just after the Caesar Caesar. That he was here was nothing less than a gift. That was happiness too. I was patching my tire, he said. That's what I wanted to ask. Do you know if we've got Val somewhere? Val? I repeated. I'm not the kind of person who ever fixes a flat tire, but who would even consider it? But my son, in the face of all evidence, still believed in a different version of his father. A version who knew where 
the valves were. What were you doing up here? He asked suddenly. You said you were looking for me. Why were you looking for me? I looked at him. I looked into the clear eyes beneath the black cap. The honest eyes that I always told myself formed a not significant part of our happiness. Oh, nothing, I said. I was just looking for you. Chapter 4 Of course they weren't there yet. That was really too much for location. I can see that the restaurant was hidden from the street by a row of trees. We were half an hour late already, and as we crossed the gravel path to the entrance, lit, by, lit on by both sides by electric torches, my wife and I discussed the possibility that for once, just this once, it might be we and not the Romans who arrived last. Want to bet? I said. Why should I? Claire said. I'm telling you, they're not there. A girl in a black t-shirt and a black four-length pitafore took a cup. Another girl in the same black outfit was flipping through the reservation book, lying open on a lectern. She was only pretending not to recognize the name Roman. I saw and pretended and pretending badly at that. Loman was it? She raised an eyebrow and made no effort to hide her disappointment at the fact that it wasn't Serge. Loman standing there and realized that two people whose faces meant nothing to her. I could have helped her out by seeing that Serge Loman was on his way, but I didn't. The left turn was booked was lit from above by a thin copper-colored reading lamp. Art Decto was some other style that happened to be just in, or just out of fashion at the moment. The girl's hair, black as a t-shirt and pitiful, was tightly tied up at the back in a wispy ponytail as though it had been designed to fit in with the restaurant's house style. The girl who had taken her coats wore her hair in the same tight ponytail. Perhaps it had something to do with regulations. I thought to myself, hygiene regulations, like surgical masks in the operating room. After all, this restaurant prided itself on serving all organic products. The meat came from actual animals, but only animals that had led a good life. Across the top of the tight black hairdos, I glanced at the dining room, or at least at the first two or three physical tables. To the left of the entrance was the open kitchen. Something was being from fade at that very moment from the looks of it, accompanied, accompanied by the obligatory clouds of blue smoke and dancing flames. I didn't feel like doing this at all, I realized. Again, my aversion to the evening that lay ahead had, been, beca had become almost physical, a slight feeling of nausea, playing hands and the start of a headache somewhere between behind my left eye, not quite enough though, for me to actually become unwell or fall un unconscious right there on the spot. How would the black pitiful girl react to a guest who claps before even getting past the lectern? I wondered. Would they try to haul me out of the way, drag me into the cloakroom? In any case, somewhere where the other guests couldn't see me, they would probably pop me up on a stool behind the coat rack. Slightly but firmly, they would ask whether they could call me a taxi. Off, off with this man! How wonderful it would be! Let Serge do. What a relief to be able to put a whole new twist on this evening. I thought about what that would mean. What what that would mean? We would go back to the cafe and order a plate of regular person food. The daily special was ribs with fries. I'd seen on the blackboard above the bar, spare ribs with fries, 11.50 euros, probably less than a tenth of what we'd have to cough up here each. Another alternative would be to head straight for home, with the very most a little detour past the video shop for a DVD, which we can then watch on the TV in the bedroom, lying on our roomy double bed, a glass of wine, some crackers, a few types of cheeses to go with, one more little detour past the night shop, and a perfect evening would be complete. I wouldn't be entirely self-effacing. I promised myself. I wouldn't. I would let Claire choose the film, even though that meant it was bound to be some costume drama, pride and prejudice, a room with a view, or something murder on the ordinary express. Expresses ish. 
Yes, that was a possibility, I thought. I could pass out and we could go home. But instead, I said, Search Loman, the table close to the garden. The girl raised her eyes from the page. But you're not Mr. Loman, she said. I cursed it all right there. The restaurant close in the black pin of horse this evening that was ruined even before it began. But most of all, I cursed Search for this dinner he'd been so keen to arrange. A dinner for which he couldn't summon up the common courtesy to arrive on time. The way he never arrived on time anywhere. People in union halls across the country had to wait for him to show up too. The oh so busy search moment was probably just running late. The meeting in the last union hall had run over and now he was caught in traffic somewhere. He didn't drive himself. No, driving would be a waste of time for someone of Serge's status. He had a chauffeur to do that for him. Chaffier for to do that for him, so he could spend his precious time curiously reading important documents. Oh yes, I am. I said, Loman is the name. I kept my eyes fixed on the girl who actually blinked this time and opened my mouth for the next sentence. The moment had come to clinch the victory, but it was a victory that smacked of defeat. I'm his brother. I said. Chapter 5 The aperitif of the house, which we'd like to offer you today, is pink champagne. The floor manager or must or supervisor, the host, the head waitress, or whatever you call someone like that in restaurants like this, was wearing a black pinafore. He had a three-piece suit on. The suit was pale green with blue pinstripes and Sticking out of the breast pocket was a blue hinky, what they call a pocket square. His voice was subdued, almost too subdued, to be heard above the hubbub in the dining room. There was something weird about the associates in this place. We noticed that as soon as we sat down at our table. On the garden side, how did I guess? If you didn't speak up, your words drifted aw away to the glass ceiling, which was also much higher than normal for a restaurant, ridiculously high. You might say if you didn't know the height of the ceiling had everything to do with the building's former use, a diary. I thought I read that somewhere. Or a sewage disposal plan. The floor manager stuck out his little finger and pointed at something on our table. At the tea light. I thought at first, instead of a candle or two, all the tables had all the tables here had a tea light. But no, the little finger was pointing out the plate of olives he had apparently just put there. In any case, I don't remember it having been there before, not when he pulled back our chairs. When he, when had he put the olives on the table? I was struck by a brief but intense wave of panic. This was happening to me more often lately. Suddenly, pieces of the puzzle were gone, bites out of time, empty moments during which my thoughts must have been elsewhere. These are Greek olives from the panel Pausy mist, lightly doused in fresh, first pressing extra virgin olive oil from Sardinia and polished off the clothes Mary from. The floor manager leaned over our table slightly as he spoke, but we could barely still hear him. In fact, the last part of the sentence became a complete loss, leaving us in the dark as to the origin of the rosemary. Normally, I don't give a damn about this kind of information. As far as I care, the rosemary could have come from the roar or the beans, but it seemed like far too much fuss over one little plate of olives, and I had no intention of letting him off the hook that easy, uh, that easily. And with that, and then that pinky, why did anyone point with their pinky? Was it, was that supposed to be chic? Did it go with the suit with blue pinstripes like the light blue hanky? Or did he simply have something to hide? And the other fingers, after all, were hidden the whole time. He kept them folded and like, against the palm of his hand, out of sight, perhaps they were covered with flaky eczema, or symptoms of some untreatable disease. Polished off, I said? Yes, polished off with rosemary. Polished off means that they... I know what it means, I said cuddly, and perhaps a bit too loudly as well. A man and woman at the table, at the next table, stopped talking for a moment and looked over at us. A man with a beard that was much too big, covering his face almost entirely. And a woman a little too young for him, in her late twenties, I figured. 
His second wife, I thought, or maybe some piece of fluff he was trying to impress by taking her to a restaurant like this. Polished off, I repeatedly, I repeated a little more quietly. I know that that doesn't mean that someone polished off the olives, as in getting rid of them or blowing them away. In the corner of, our, of my eye, I saw that Claire had turned her head and was gazing out the window. Things were not off to a good start. The evening was already ruined. There was no need for me to ruin any, it any further, especially not for my wife. And then the manager did something I hadn't expected. I had more or less counted on seeing his mouth fall open, his lower lip start to tremble, and perhaps even the stir of a blush. After which he would stamper of some vague apology, something he'd been taught to bridle off, a protocol for dealing with rude and difficult guests. But instead he burst out laughing. What's more, it was a real laugh, not a fake or polite laugh. I'm sorry, he said, raising his hand to his mouth. The fingers were still curled as they'd been when he pointed at the olives a minute ago. Only the pinky was sticking out. I never thought about it like that. Chapter 6 What's with the suit? I asked Claire after we both said that we liked the apertif of the house and the poor manager had walked away from our table. Claire raised her hand and brushed my cheek. Sweet. No, listen, it's weird. He's wearing it for a reason, right? You're not going to tell me that it's not on purpose. My wife gave me a lovely smile. The smile she always bestowed on me when she thought I was getting worked up about nothing. A smile that so much as said that she found all the fuss entertaining at best. But that I mustn't think for one second that she was going to take it seriously. And then the tea light? I said, why not a teddy bear? Or a silent vigil? Claire took a pet pillow Tunisian olive from the play and put it in her mouth. Mmm, she said. Lovely. Too bad, though, you really can taste that the rosemary has had too little sunlight. Now, it was my turn to smile. The rosemary. The miniature had told us finally was homegrown from a glassed-in herbarium behind the restaurant. Did you notice how he points with his pinky all the time? I said, opening the menu. What I was in fact planning to do was look at the prices of the entrance. The prices in all the restaurants like this always fascinate me. Let me make it clear right away that I'm not stingy by nature. That has nothing to do with it. But I'm also not going to claim that money is no object. But yes, but I'm light years removed from people who say it's a waste of money to eat, a re to eat in a restaurant while at home even make things that are so much nicer. No, people like that don't understand anything that's not about food and not about restaurants. My fascination isn't that kind of fascination. It has to do with what, for the sake of convenience, I call the yawning chasm between the dish itself and the price you have to pay for it. As though the two variables, money on one side, food on the other, had nothing to do with each other. As though... They inhabit two separate worlds, and have no business being side by side on the same menu. That was what I was planning to do. I was going to read the names of dishes and then the prices that were printed next to them. But my eye was caught by something on the left hand page. I looked, looked again, then peered around the restaurant to see if I could spot the manager's suit. What is it? Claire asked. Did you see what it says here? My wife looked at me questioning. It says, Operative of the house, 10 euros. Oh, but that's insane, isn't it? The man said, we'd like to offer you the apertite of the house, right? The apertite of the house is pink champagne. So what are you supposed to think? They, You think that they're offering you the pink champagne, or am I not? If they offer you something, you get it, right? Can we offer you this or that of the house? Then it shouldn't cost 10 euros. It should be free. No, wait a minute, not always. If the menu says steak of la maison, steak of the house, in other words, it means that it was prepared according to the recipe of the house. Now, that's not an example. House wine. Wine of the house. That doesn't mean you get the wine for free, does it? All right. Okay, that's obvious, but this is different. I hadn't even looked at the menu yet. Someone in three-piece suit pulls back your chair for you, puts down a lousy piece of plate of olives, and then say something about offering you the aperitif of the house. That's at least a little confusing, isn't it? Then it sounds as though you're petting it. 
not that you have to pay 10 euros for it, right? 10 euros. 10. Look at it this way. Would we have ordered a little glass of bland pink champagne if we know that it cost 10 euros? No. That's what I'm saying. They tricked me into it with that horseshit about the upper teeth of the house. You're right. I looked at my wife, but she looked back earnestly. No, I'm not pulling your leg. She said, you're right. It really is different from steak a la maison or a house wine. It is weird. It's almost like they do it on purpose to see if you'll fall for it. Is it? Isn't it? In the distance, I saw the three-piece suit flash by into the open kitchen. I raised my hand and waved, but the only one who noticed was one of the black peanut four girls. She hurried over to our table. Listen here, I said as I held up the menu for the girl to see. I glanced over at Claire for support for affection, perhaps only for an understanding look. A look that said, you can have with the two of us. Not when it came to the so-called apertise of the house, but Claire's eyes were fixed on something in long way behind me at the entrance to the restaurant. Here they come, she said. Chapter 7 Usually Claire always sits facing the wall, but tonight it was done with the other way around. No, no, it's your turn for a change. I said when the manager slid back her chairs and she moved automatically toward the seat to look out toward the garden. Usually I'm the one who sits on the back of the garden, or the wall, or the open kitchen. This simple reason that I want to be able to see everything. Claire will see how my way. She knows I don't like staring at walls or gardens, that I'd rather look at the people. Come on now, she said as the floor manager stood, waving politely, his hands on the back of the chair. The chair with the restaurant view that he had pulled back from my life as a matter of principle. This is where you want to sit, isn't it? It's not that Claire goes out of her way to appease me, it's just something she has inside of her. A sort of inner calm or depth that makes that makes her content with blank walls and open kitchens, or like here with a few patches of green between gravel paths, with a rectangular pond and a few low hedges outside a window that stretches from the glass ceiling all the way to the floor. There must have been trees out there too somewhere, but the combination of falling darkness and reflecting glass made it impossible to tell. That's all she seems to need. That and a view of my face. Not tonight, I said. Tonight all I want to see is you. That's what I was planning to add, but I couldn't bring myself to say that out loud. With the manager standing there in his pink shirt. That evening, all I wanted was to cling to my life's familiar face. But there was another, not unimportant reason for me to sit facing the garden, and that I could allow my brother's entrance to go unseen. The bustle at the door, the predictable groveling of the manager, and the pinnacle four girls and the other guests were re reactions but when the moment finally came i turned in my chair and looked anyway everyone of course had noticed the roman's arrival there was even what you might describe as a stippled tones looked around the lecture no fewer than three girls in pinafores were fussing over search and babette the manager was hovering around the lectern too and there was someone out there as well, a little man with crisply gray hair, dressed not in, not in black from head to toe, but simply in jeans and a white turtleneck. The restaurant owner, I suspected. Yes, it had to be the owner, for now he stepped forward to extend a personal welcome to Serge and Babette. They know me there, Serge had told me a few days ago. He knew the man in the white turtleneck, a man who didn't emerge from the open kitchen to shake hands with just anybody. The guests, however, pretended not to know this. In a restaurant where you had to pay 10 euros for the appetite of the house, the rules of etiquette probably didn't allow for an open display of recognition. They all seemed to lean a few fractions of an inch closer to the plate, all apparently doing their best at the time. At the same time, they forged ahead with their conversations to avoid falling silent because the volume of the general hubbub increased audibly as well. And while the manager, the white turtleneck, had disappeared into the kitchen, was escorting Serge and Buffett past the table no more than a barely perceptible ripple ran across the restaurant, a breeze falling across the still smooth surface 
cut upon a breeze of wind through a field of grain, no more than that. Serge smiled broadly and rubbed his hands together while Babette remained a few steps behind. Judging by the little steps she took, her heels were probably too high for her to keep up with them. Claire! He spread his arms. My wife was already out of her chair and were pecking each other three times on the cheek. There was nothing I could do but stand. Remaining seated would, would require too many exclamations. Babette! I said, taking my brother's wife by the elbow. In fact, I had, ca- I had counted on her turning to her cheek for me, for the obligatory, obligatory three kisses and kisses the air beside my own cheek, but instead I felt the soft pressure of her mouth. First on my, my one cheek, then the other, the third and final time she pressed her lips. No, not exactly to my mouth, but right beside it. Dangerously close to my mouth, one might say. We looked at each other, she was wearing glasses as usual, but they looked different from the ones she had been wearing last time. I at least couldn't remember her glasses having such dark lenses. But Bet, as I mentioned earlier, is one of those women who look good in anything, including glasses. Yet there was something else, something different about her this time. Like a room where someone has thrown out all the flowers while you were gone. A change in the interior you don't even notice at first, not until you see the stem sticking out of the garbage. To call my brother's wife a present would be putting in my way. There were men I knew who felt intimidated or even threatened by her future. She was in fact, no fatness or thinness, had very little to do with it. The proportions of her body were in perfect harmony. Everything about her, though, was big and soft. Her hands, her feet, her head was too big. To and too broad, these men thought, and they went on to make distinguish for the size and birth of other parts of the body, as if somehow to reduce the threat to human proportion. In high school, I had a friend who was six feet, six inches tall. I remember how tiring it could be to always be standing next to someone who towered head and shoulders above you as though you were literally standing in this shadow. And as though that shadow kept you from getting enough sunlight, less sunlight than I deserved, I thought at times. Of course, there was the usual stiff neck and looking up all the time, but that was the least of it. In December, we would go on vacation together. My high school buddy was not fat either, only tall. But still, I experienced every movement of his arms and leg, and the feet that stuck out of his sleeping bag and pressed against the inside of the canvas, a struggle for more space, a struggle for which I felt in part responsible, and that physically, physically drained me. And sometimes in the morning, his feet would be sticking out of the entrance to the tent, and that made me feel guilty. Guilty about the fact that tents weren't longer, weren't larger, so that people like him could fit in them completely. When Babette is around, I always do my best to make myself bigger, taller than I really am. I stretch so she can look at me straight in the eye, as equal. You're looking good, said Babette, giving my arms a little squeeze. With most people, especially women, a compliment on your appearance means nothing at all, but with Babette it did. I found that in the course of the years, when someone she liked was bad, she said that too. You're looking good could therefore mean that I did indeed feel good. But it could also be an indirect request that I see something about her own appearance. In any event, to pay more attention to it than usual. I took another look at her eyes behind those lenses that reflected almost an entire restaurant. The dinners, the white tablecloths, the teapot warmers. Yes, dozens of teapot warmers were glittering in those lenses that I saw now were really only dark at the top, below that they were only slightly frozen, so I could see the best eyes clearly. They were red around the edges, and bigger than normal, unmistakable signs of a recent crying jag. Not a crying jag that had happened a few hours ago, no, crying that had happened just now, in the car, on the way to the restaurant. Maybe she stopped in the parking lot and tried to cover up the worst of it. But it hadn't really worked. The dark lenses might have fooled the staff, the staff at the black pit and the forest, the floor manager in his three-piece suit, and the smart owner in the white turtleneck, but they didn't fool me. And at the same time, I knew for certain that Babette wasn't trying to fool me at all. 
She didn't come close to me with any issue. She had almost kissed me on the lips. I had no choice but to look into her damp eyes and draw my own conclusion. Now she blinked and shrugged, body from which I can only mean I'm sorry. Before I could say anything, though, Serge bored ahead, almost pushing his wife aside as he seized my hand and shook her forcefully. He never used to have such a powerful handshake. In the last few years, he had realized that the people of his country had to be met with a firm grip that they would never vote for a fishy handshake. Paul, he said. He was still smiling, but there was no feeling behind it. Keep on smiling. You could see him thinking. The smile came from the same carload as the handshake. Together, in seven months' time, they were going to lead him to a lecture electoral victory. Even if this had were to be pelted with wanton eggs, the smile had to remain intact. Even behind the remains of a clean pie pressed into its face by an angry activist, the smile could never ever fade from the voter's view. Hi, Serge, I said, how are you doing? Meanwhile, behind my brother's back, Claire was seen to the bed. They kissed, that is to say, my wife kissed her sister's in-laws, cheeks, and hugs. Then looked into each other's eyes. Did Claire see what I had seen? Did she see the same red-rimmed despair behind the tinted lenses? But just then, Babette laughed elatedly, and I missed seeing how she kissed the air behind Claire's cheeks. We sat down, Serge diagonally across from, from beside my wife, while Babette, with the manager's assistance, sank into the chair beside me. One of the black pinafore girls saw the Serge, who stood with one hand in his pocket for a moment, looking around the restaurant before settling himself down. The aperitif at the house today is pink champagne, the manager said. I took a deep breath. Too deep, apparently, because the look of my, the look my wife gave me was trying to tell me something. She rarely rolled her eyes or cleared her throat. A pro pose of Nucky, and she never ever kicked me underneath the table to warn me that I was about to make a fool of myself or had already done so. No, it was a very subtle something in her eyes, a shift invisible to the initiated. Something between mockery and subtle, sudden earnest. Don't, the look said. Mm, champagne, Babette said. Okay, sounds good, Sir said. Wait a minute, I said. Appetizer, Chapter 8 The crayfish are dressed in a vinaigrette of tarragon and baby green onions, said the manager. He was at Serge's plate, now pointing with his pinky. And these are chanterelles from the those yes. The pinky bolted over the crayfish to point out two brown toadstools cut lengthwise. The chanterelle looks as though they had been uprooted only a few minutes ago. What was sticking to the bottom, I figured, could only be dirt. It was a well-groomed hand, as I'd established while the manager was uncorking. The bottle of Chablis Serge had had ordered. Despite my earlier suspicions, there was nothing for him to hide. Neat cuticles without hangnails. The nail itself trimmed short, no rings. It looked freshly washed, no signs of anything clung. For the hand of a stranger, though, I felt it was coming too close to our food, and it hovered less than an inch above the crayfish. The pinky itself came even closer, almost brushing the chanterelle. I wasn't sure I would still be able to sit still when that hand, with its pinky, was floating over my own plate. But for the sake of a pleasant evening, I knew it would be better to restrain myself. Yes, that's exactly what I would do, I decided. I would restrain myself. I would keep hold of myself the way you hold your breath underwater, and I would act as though there was nothing strange at all about the hand of a perfect ginger waving over the food on my plates. To be honest, though, there was something that was starting to get on my nerves, and that was how long everything took. Even while opening the bottle of Chablis, the manager mucked around. First, he installed the cooler, one of those buckets with two handles that you hook over the edge of the table, like a child's seat. Then, while presenting the bottle, the label, to Serge, of course, Serge had asked our permission to choose the wine. At least he'd been civil enough to do that. But all this, I know everything about wine business, irritated the hell out of me. 
I can't remember when he first presented himself as a connoisseur. In my, mem in my memory, it seems to have happened quite suddenly. From one day to the next, he became the one who picked up the wine list and mumbled something about the earthly aftertaste of Portuguese wines from the Altonio. It had been sort of a coup, really, from that day on. The wine list automatically ended up in Serge's hands. After presenting the label and receiving my brother's nod of approval, the manager began uncorking the bottle. Operating the corkscrew and became clear right away was not his strong suit. He tried to disguise that a bit by shrugging and laughing at his own clumsiness the whole time with a positive air that said this was certainly the first time anything like this had happened to him, but it was precisely that air that gave him away. Well, it doesn't seem to want to cooperate. He said as the top of the cork broke off, and the wreckage came out with the corkscrew. The manager was now faced with a dilemma. Should he try to ease the other half of the cork out of the bottle, here at the table under our watchful eyes? Or would it be wiser to take the bottle back to the open kitchen for some expert help? The simplest solution, unfortunately, was the unthinkable. To push the stubborn half of the cork down into the bottle, with the handle of a fork or spoon. You might find little crumbs of cork in your glass afterward, but so what? Who cares? How much did this shabbless cost? 58 euros? The price meant nothing anyway, or at most it meant that you had an excellent chance of coming across exactly the same wine on the supermarket shop tomorrow for 7 and 95 cents or less. Excuse me, the manager said, I'm going to fetch another bottle for you. And before we could say another word, he went striding off past the other tables. Ah, well, I said, I suppose it's like a hospital. You're better off praying that one of the nurses will take the blood and not the specialist himself. Claire laughed out loud. And Babette laughed too. Oh, I feel so bad for him, she said. Serge, though, sat there groaning. The look on his face was almost sorrowful, as though something had been taken away from him. His little toy, his self-important lather about wines and vintages and earthly grapes. Indirectly, the manager's bumbling reflected on him. He, Serge Lohman, had picked the chef list with the button cork. He had been looking forward to an orderly process. The reading of a label, the approving nod, the simple food that the manager would pour into his glass. That last bit above all, that was by now one thing I couldn't stand to watch anymore. Couldn't bear to hear the sniffling, the gargling, the smacking of his lips, the wine that my brother would roll across his tongue, all the way to his gullet, and then back again. I always had a look over there. Let's hope the other bottles don't have the same problem, he said. That would be a pity. It really is an excellent shadow. He was clearly in a bad way. He was the one who picked out this restaurant. They knew him here. The man in the white turtleneck knew him and had come out of the open kitchen, especially to shape his hand. I wonder what would have happened if I had picked the restaurant. A different restaurant. One he'd never been to before. And the manager or a waiter had failed to uncork the wine at one go. You could bet your life on it that he would have smiled pitifully. Then shaking his head, oh yes, I knew my brother well enough by now. He would have given me a look with a message only I could read. That call, he always takes us to the weirdest places. You have big, big politicos who like to work in the kitchen, who collect old comic books or have a wooden boat. They fix all by themselves. The hobby they choose usually clashes entirely with the face that goes with it going completely against the grain of what everyone has made of them until then. The worst sink in the mud. Someone with all the charisma of a sheet of a, of a cart board suddenly turns out to cook splendid French meals at his home in his free time. The next weekend supplement of the national newspaper features him in full cover on the in full color on the cover. His knitted oven mitts holding up a casserole filled with the most striking thing about the stick in the mud, besides the aping with the reproduction of a two-word live brick poster, is his completely impossible smile, meant to convey the joy of cooking to his 
fluency, not so much a smile really, as a fearful bearing of the piece, a sort of smile where it was just the rear ended and had lived to tell a tale, in which above all, all communities were believed at the simple fact that the Probenko Milo had not been burned to a crisp in the oven. What exactly had Serge been thinking when he chose wine as his particular hobby? I'd have to ask him sometime, maybe this evening. I made a mental note. This wasn't the right moment, but the night was young. When we were living at home, all he ever drank was cola, huge amounts of it. He had no problem knocking back an entire case size bottle at dinner time. Then he would produce these gigantic bleaches, for which he was sometimes sent to his room. Bleaches that lasted 10 seconds or longer, like subterranean thunder, rolling up and exploding from somewhere deep down in the stomach, and for which he enjoyed a certain schoolyard frame. Fame, among the boys, that is, for he knew even then that girls were only repulsed by folks and folks. The next step had been the conversion of what was formerly a messy walk-in closet into a wine cellar. He bought racks to stack the bottles in to let the wine age, as he put it. When the guests came to dinner, he began to deliver lectures about the wine being served. Babette viewed it with all kind of amusement. Perhaps she was the first one to see him through. To see through him. The first not to completely believe in him and his hobby. I remember calling him to talk to Serge one afternoon and getting Babette on the line. Serge wasn't there. He's tasting wine in the lower valley, she said. There was something in her voice, something about the way she said tasting wine and lower valley. The tone a woman uses when she says her husband is working late, even though she's known for a year that he's having an affair with his secretary. Claire, as I noted earlier, is smarter than I am, but she doesn't blame me for not being her equal. What I meant to say is that she never looks down her nose at me. She doesn't sigh deeply or roll her eyes when I don't get something right away. Obviously, I have no way of knowing when she talks about me when I'm all around, but I'm very sure I have absolute faith in the fact that Claire would never adopt the tone of Detective Lee Babette's voice when she said, he's tasting wine in the lower valley. Babette, in the other words, is also much smarter than Serge. That's not saying a hell of a lot. I might add, but I won't. Some things speak for themselves. All I want to talk about here are the things I heard and saw during our little get-together at the restaurant. Chapter 9 the lamb's neck sweetbread has been marinated in sardinian olive oil and is served with arugula, said the manager, who had by now arrived at Claire's plate and was pointing with his pinky at two minuscule pieces of meat. The sun-dried tomatoes come from Bulgaria. The first thing that struck you about Claire's plate was its vast emptiness. Of course, I'm well aware, in the better restaurant's quality takes precedence over quantity, but you have voids and then you have voids. The void here, that part of the plate on which no food at all was present, had clearly been raised to a matter of principle. It was as though the empty plate was challenging you to say something about it, to go to the open kitchen and demand an explanation. You wouldn't even dare, the plate said, and laughed in your face. I tried to recall the price. The cheapest appetizer was 19 euros. The entra- entries varied from 28 to 47. And then there were three sets of menus of 47, 58, and 79 euros each. This is warm goat cheese with pine nuts and walnut shavings. The hand which with the pinky was above my plate now. I fought back the urge to say, I know, because that's what I ordered, and concentrated on the pinky. This was the closest he had come to me this evening, even when pouring the wine. The manager had finally opted for the easiest solution and come back from the open kitchen with a new bottle, the cork already striking halfway, sticking halfway out of the neck. After the wine cellar and the trip to the Loire Valley, there had been the six-week wine course, not in France, but in a classroom at a night school. Serge had hung the diploma, diploma in the hallway, somewhere no one could possibly miss it. A bottle with the cork sticking out of it 
could contain something very different from what was on the label. That must have been dealt with during one of his very first lessons in the classroom. It could have been messed with. A malicious person could have diluted the wine with tap water or dribbled saliva down the neck. But after the upper teeth of the house and the broken cork, Sir Sloman apparently was not in the mood for any more mucking about. Without looking at the manager, he had wiped his lips with his napkin and mumbled that the wine was excellent. At that moment, I glanced over at Babette. Her eyes behind the tinted lenses were fixed on her husband. It was almost impossible to tell, but I would almost have sworn that she raised an eyebrow when he passed his judgment on the pre-uncorked wine. In the car, on the way to the restaurant, he had made her cry, but by now her eyes were, mu were looking much less swollen. I hoped she would say something, something to get back at him. She was entirely capable of that. But that could be very sarcastic when she put her mind to it. He's tasting wine in Lower Valley had been one of the mildest expressions of that. In my mind, I egged her on. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. When it came right down to it, that might, been best, that might have been the best thing. A huge knockdown, drag out fight between Serge and Babette before we moved on to the main course. I would speak soothing words, pretend not to take sides, but she would know that she could count on me. To my regret though, Babette said nothing at all. You can almost see the way she gulped back her undoubtedly murderous comment about the court. But still, something had now taken place that kept my kept alive my hopes of an explosion later in the evening. It's like a pistol in a stage play. When someone waves a pistol during the first act, you can bet your bottom dollar that someone will be shot with it before the curtain falls. That's the law of drama. The law says no pistol must appear if no one's going to fire it. This is lamb's lettuce, the manager said. I looked at the pinky, which was no more than a centimeter away from three or four curly little green leaves, and the melted chunk of goat's cheese, and then at the entire hand, which was so close that I would have only had to lean forward a little to kiss it. Why had I ordered this appetizer when I don't even like goat's cheese? To say nothing of lamb's lettuce. This time, the stingy portions worked in my favor. My plate, too, was mostly empty, although not as empty as Claire's. I could have devoured the three leaves in a single bite, or simply left them lying on the plate, which amounted to pretty much the same thing. Whenever I see lamb's lettuce, I'm reminded of the little cage with the hamster or a guinea pig that stood on the window, still, of our classroom in elementary school. It was there because it was good for us to learn about animals, to learn to take care of animals, I suppose. Whether the little leaves would push through the bars of the cage each morning were lamb's lettuce, I can't remember, but they looked a lot like it. The hamster or guinea pig nibbled at the leaves and then spent the rest of the day sitting in one corner of its cage. One morning it was dead, just like the little turtle. The two white mice and the stick in the stick insects that had preceded it. What we were supposed to learn from this high mortality rate was never dealt with in the class. The reason why I now had a plate of warm goat's cheese with lamb's lettuce in front of me was simpler than it seemed. I had been the last to order. We hadn't really talked beforehand about what we were going to have, or maybe we had, and I missed it. Whatever the case, I settled on the vitilo bonado, but Babette, to my horror, ordered exactly the same thing. No problem at that point, I could always switch to my second choice, the oysters, but the next to second last person to order right after Claire was Serge, and when Serge ordered the oysters, I was stuck. I had no desire to order the same appetizer as someone else, but to have the same appetizer as my brother was out of the question. Theoretically speaking, I could have switched back to the Fitilo Bonado, but that was purely theoretical. It didn't feel right. Not only would it look as though I wasn't original enough to to choose an appetizer of my own, but in my insurgent's eyes raised the suspicion that I was trying to close ranks with his wife, which was true, of course, but I couldn't be so obvious. I had already closed the menu when and laid it beside my plate. Now I opened it again, reading like lightning, I skimmed down through the list of appetizers. I adopted the thoughtful I'd, I adopted a thoughtful expression as though I was only looking for the dish I'd already chosen in order to point it out on the menu. 
but by then, of course, it was much too late. And for you, sir, the manager asked, the melted goat cheese with lamb lettuce, I said. It came out a little too readily, a little too sure of myself to sound credible. Serge Babette didn't notice the thing, but across the table I saw the look of bewilderment on Claire's face. Would she try to protect me from myself? Would she say, but you don't like goat's cheese? I wasn't sure. At that moment, too many pairs of eyes were on me for me to shake my head at her, but I wasn't taking any chances. I hear the goat cheese is from a urban farm, I said. From goats that live out on the open. At last, after he had granted thorough attention to Babette's Vivido Tornado, the Vivido Tornado that, in the best of all words, worlds, could have been my Vivido Tornado. The manager left and we were able to resume our conversation. Resume was not exactly the not exactly the right word, though. As it turned out, none of us had the slightest idea of what we've been talking about before the appetizers arrived. That was one of the disadvantages disadvantages of these so called top restaurants. All the interruptions, like the exaggerated detailed review of every pine nut on your plate, the endless uncorking of wine bottles, and the unsolicited topping up of glasses made you lose track. As far as that continual topping up goes, let me say this, I have traveled a bit. I have been to restaurants in many countries, but nowhere, and when I say nowhere, I literally mean nowhere, do they top up your wine without asking for it. They would consider that rude. Only in Holland do they come up to your table all the time. Not only do they top up your glass, but they also cast a wistful eye at the bottle when it seems to be getting empty. Isn't it about time to order another one, is what those looks are meant to say. I know someone, an old friend, who spent a few years working in Dutch top restaurants. Their tactic, he told me once, is, is actually to force as much wine as possible down your throat. Wine they sell for seven times what the importer charges for it. And that's why they always wait so long between bringing the appetizer and taking orders for the entree. People will order more wine out of pure boredom, just to kill time. That's the way they figure it. The appetizer usually arrives quite quickly. My friends said because if the appetizer takes too long people start complaining they start to doubt their choice of restaurant but after a while when they've had too much drink between appetizer and entree they lose track of time he knew of cases where the entrees had been ready to, for a long time but remained on the place in the kitchen because the people at the table in question were complaining only when there was a lull in the conversation and the customers began to look around impatiently were the plates shoved in the microwave what had been we been talking about before the appetizers ca came? Not that it really mattered. It couldn't have been anything important. But that was what it made it so ir ir irritating. It, I could remember what we said after all the fuss with the cork and the placing of our orders, but I had no idea what what had been going on right before our plates arrived. But Beth had joined a new gym. We talked about that a bit, about losing weight, the importance of remaining active, and which sport was best for which person. Claire was thinking about joining the health club and searched had said he couldn't stand the obstructed music at most places like that. That's why he'd taken up running, he said, where you could be out on your own in the fresh air, and he, and he acted as though he had come up with the idea all by himself. He conveniently forgot that I had started running years ago, and how he had never missed an opportunity to make snide comments about his little brother out trotting around. Yes, that's what we had talked about, talked about at first, for rather too long for my taste, but an innocent subject to be sure. A fairly typical prelude to a standard restaurant evening. But for the rest of the evening, not if my life depended on it. I looked at Serge, at my wife, and then at Babette. At that moment, Babette began jabbing her fork into her vivido tornado, cut off a slice, and raised it to her mouth. But now I've completely forgotten, she said, the fork poised in the air. Did you say you two have already seen the new Woodley Allen or not? Chapter 10 when the conversation turns too quickly to films, I see it as a sign of weakness. I mean, films are more something for the end of the evening, when you really don't have much else to talk about. I don't know why, but when people start talking about films, I always get a thinking feeling, feeling in the pit of my stomach. Like when you wake up in the morning, you find that it's only getting dark outside. The worst are those people who describe entire films. They get right into it. They have no qualms about taking uh, 15 minutes of your time. 15 minutes per film, that, that is. They don't really care whether you haven't seen the film in question or whether you saw it a long time ago. Such considerations don't bother them. They're already right in the middle of the opening scene. To be polite, you 
gain interest at first, but soon you bid farewell to courtesy. You yawn openly, stare at the ceiling, and squirm around in your chair. You do everything in your power to make the narrator shut up, but nothing helps. They're, t they're too far gone to notice the signals. The signals. Above all, they're addicted to themselves and their own crap about films. I believe it was my brother who started in about the new Woody Allen. A masterpiece, he said, without asking whether we, that is Claire and I, might have seen it already. Babette nodded empathically at this. They had seen it together last weekend. They were in agreement about something for a change. A masterpiece, she said. Really, you two have to go. To which Claire said that we we had already been. Two months ago, I added, which in fact was unnecessary. It was just something I felt like saying. It wasn't aimed at Babette, but at my brother. I wanted him. I wanted to let him know that he was running pretty far behind with his masterpieces. At that moment, a beefy of girls in black pinafores arrived with their appetizers, followed by the manager and his pinky. And we lost track of where we were until Babette picked up the thread again with her about her question whether or not we had already seen it, the new Woody Allen. I thought it was a great film, Claire said as he as she dipped a sun-dried tomato in the olive oil on her plate and raised it to her lips. Even Paul liked it, didn't you, Paul? Claire does that all the time, draws me to things in a way that I can't back out. Now the others already knew that I had liked it, and even Paul meant something along the lines of even Paul, who doesn't usually like any film, especially something by Woody, Woody Allen. Serge looked at me, a morsel of appetizer still in his mouth. He was chewing on it, but that didn't stop him from addressing himself to me. A masterpiece, right? No, really. Fantastic. He went on chewing and then gulped. And that Scarlett Johansson. I want to kick her, kick her out of bed for eating crackers. Good lord, what a beauty. Hearing your other, older brother refer to a film you yourself think is pretty good as a masterpiece is kind of like having to wear that brother's old clothes, the hand-me-downs that have become too small for him but which in your eyes are above all odd. My options were limited. Admitting that Woody Allen's film was a masterpiece would be like wriggling into those old clothes and was therefore out of the question. There was no superlative for the masterpiece. The most I could do was to prove that Serge hadn't understood the film, that he considered it a masterpiece for all the wrong reasons, but that would involve a lot of effort. It would be laying it on rather thick for Claire and probably for Babette as well. In fact, there was only one option left, and that was to run Woody Allen's film into the ground. It wouldn't be too hard. There were enough there were enough weaknesses I could point out. Weaknesses that don't really matter when you like a film, but that you can make use of in an emergency in order to divide, dislike the same film. Claire would raise her eyebrows at first. Then hopefully realized what I was doing, that my betrayal of her shared appreciation for the film was in service of the struggle against spineless, showy-off crap about films in general. I reached for my glass of Chablis, intending, intending first to take a thoughtful sip before carrying out this latter strategy, when suddenly I saw another way out. What was it my idiot brother had said anyway? Oh, Scarlett Johansson? Kick her out of bed for eating crackers? A beauty? I didn't know what Babette thought of, thought of that kind of crass macho chop, but Claire always got up on her hind legs when men started in about sweet asses and nice tits. I'd been looking at my brother when he said that about the crackers and had missed her reaction, but that wasn't even necessary. Sometimes recently, I had the impression that he's starting to lose touch with reality, that he seriously thinks that the Scarlett Johansson of his world would like nothing more than to eat crackers in his bed. I suspected him of viewing women in more or less the same way that he viewed food, food, his daily hot meal in particular. That was how he used to be. And to be honest, it's never really changed. I need to eat something, Serge says when he's hungry. He'll say that when you're out hiking somewhere in a national park, far from civilization or driving down the highway between two exits. Sure, I would say then, but right now we don't have anything to eat. But I'm hungry right now, Serge would say. I need to eat now. There was something pitiful about this. This dumb resolve that would make him forget everything else. His surroundings, the people he was with, and focus on only one objective. Stating his own hunger. 
At moments like this, he reminded me of an animal that encounters an obstacle in its path. A bird that doesn't understand that the glass in the window plane is made out of solid matter and flies into it again and again. And when we, we would finally find a place to eat, it was never a pretty sight. He would eat the way one fills the tank with gas. He would devour his cheese sandwich with white bread or his almond cake quickly and efficiently to make sure the fuel reached his stomach as soon as possible. Without fuel, there was no way you could go on. The real fine dining came much later, like his knowledge of wine. At a certain point, he decided it was necessary. But the speed and efficiency remained. Even these days, he was always the first to empty his plate. I would have paid a fortune to see and hear just once how things went in the bedroom between him and Babette. On the other hand, there is a part of me that would actually resist that with every fiber of my being that would that would pay an equally great fortune never to have to find out. I need to fuck. And then Babette saying she has a headache, that she's having her period, or that this evening she doesn't even want to think about it, about his body, his arms, his legs, his head, his mouth. But I need to fuck right now. I bet my brother fucks the same way he eats. But he stuffs himself into a woman in the same way he stuffs a beef croet into his mouth, and that his hunger is then stilled. So you were mostly sitting there looking at Scarlett Johansson's tits, I say, much more crudely than I planned, or do you mean something else when you say a masterpiece? A miraculous kind of silence fell then, the kind you only hear in restaurants. A sudden raised awareness of the presence of others, the buzzing and the click of culture on plate at 30 other tables. The one or two be calm seconds when background noises become foreground noises. The first thing to break the silence was Babette's laughter. I glanced up at my wife who was staring at me in dismay and then back at search. He was trying to laugh too, but his heart wasn't in it. What's more, he still had his food in his mouth. Come, come, Paul. Not so holier than though, he said. She just happens to be a babe. A man has his eyes on his head, doesn't he? A babe. Claire wouldn't like that one either. I knew that. She would always say, a girl like a man never tasty, let alone nice act. All that fashionable talk about nice act, it's too con try for me when women start talking like that. She said once, it's like when women suddenly start smoking pipes or spinning on the ground. With every fiber of his being, George had remained a yogo, a boorish lute, the same boorish lute who used to get sent from the table for, for farting. I also think Scarlett Johansson is a very attractive woman, I said, but it sounded sort of like you were, you thought that was the most significant thing about the film. Do correct me if I'm wrong. Well, things go completely wrong with that. What's his name? That Englishman? That tennis teacher? Because he can't get her off her mind. He even has to shoot her just to get what he wants. Hey, Babette said, don't say that. It ruins it if you haven't seen it yet. Another brief silence descended, during which Babette looked from Claire to me. Oh, shit. I think I must have been asleep. You two did see it already.